We just thank you so much for this opportunity to be here uh, in the presence of your people. Uh, Lord, we are gathered here, and uh, this is our declaration as we begin uh, this worship service. We are here uh, to worship the mighty name of Jesus, and we invite your Holy Spirit here because we are gathered in the name of Jesus. And uh, Lord, we've surpassed the two or three gathering here. So Lord, we just invite your Spirit to come and to take control of this time and to unite our hearts in worship and in song and uh, use this time, Lord, uh, for eternity. May this be an investment with your children in your very presence. Lord, we thank you for your love for us, and we thank you for the awesome power of worship. We worship you in spirit and in truth as we pray these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Another great song of celebration. Sing to the King. Sing to the King who is coming to reign. Do you believe that? To Jesus, the Lamb that was saved. Life and salvation is ever. Church, let me hear you sing. Yeah. 
Psalm 103, it describes our God this way. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sin deserves or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. The wind blows over it and it is gone and its place remembers it no more. But from everlasting to everlasting, the Lord's love is with those who fear him. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper Never alone. You're a good, good father. To you are. To you are. To you are. And I'm loved by you. To you I am. To you I am. To you I am.
last time. Let's say that out. Praise the Father. Through 27 will be this evening's scripture passage. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with the angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. You just uh, join me in prayer. Uh, Lord God, we uh, just want to pause as we come before you and uh, seek to hear from your word. Lord, open our ears, open our hearts, open our minds to the things that you want to say to us. And Lord, in in my weakness and my brokenness, may the power and the majesty of your word shine forth and, and change hearts and change destinies, Lord. For those that are here, those that are watching online, Lord, we, we ask that we would come to this message with surrendered hearts before the God of the universe to hear from Jesus, to learn from him, and ultimately to be more like him. We pray these things all in his precious and beautiful name. Amen. Well, a number of weeks ago, whoa, that's really loud. Might want to dial that back a little bit there, Talon. Uh, Whenever we have guest speakers here, they have to really crank it back there, and then when I come back, they're like, yikes, our pastor's really pretty loud. Um, A number of weeks ago, we met together and began a series of messages on what it means to have a God who speaks, and uh, the the, the title of the messages have been, When the Call Comes, and this is, I think, an important message for, for our time because I think it's easy to get into the habit or the routine of thinking or believing that uh, God is uh, a God of our salvation, he's a God of history, and that everything that we needed he accomplished in Christ, which is true, uh, and that was the end of the story, which is not true. The gospel message is a message rooted in the cross, rooted in the empty tomb, but born out in the lives of those who have surrendered themselves to his lordship, to his leadership, and are filled by his Holy Spirit today, and are living the kingdom life now. Now. It starts now. Eternity starts now. It doesn't start on the day that you breathe your last. It has begun. Everlasting life for the believer in Jesus Christ has begun. The transition hasn't happened yet for this side of the veil to that side of the veil. It's just a veil. But eternity has begun. And our God is a God who interacts with his people, who speaks to his children, who wants to convey his heart and his message to us. He does this in many different ways. And we've looked at these over the weeks. 
God ultimately speaking through his word. He, God is never going to tell you something to do, never command you to do something that would be in violation of his word. He's given us the body of, of Christ, the believers, uh, wisdom and counsel. Uh, Proverbs talks in a number of different places about getting wise counsel for uh, decisions that we're making in life. Uh, prayer, uh, so many different ways in which we can hear the voice of God. And, and if you look through scripture, you'll find God used dreams and God used animals and God used nature and God used everything at his disposal because it's all his. And we sell him short and we sell ourselves short and we cripple our spiritual lives when we walk away with the conclusion, God's done speaking. God's got nothing else to say. It's up to me to just eke this Christian life out and when I die, I'll be with him. That is not the biblical model of following Jesus. God is a God who speaks. And as we trace this series out, we began uh, by looking at the God who calls us to relationship in himself. We looked at Samuel in the Old Testament, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, as God is calling to Samuel, and uh, his initial call on anyone's life is a call to relationship. God calls us to himself to be in relationship with him. And we unpacked that in that message a few weeks back. And then, to my surprise, we took two weeks to consider the second aspect of being a follower of God, of a God who calls, because he is a God who calls us to serve. And I say to my surprise, because we were unpacking the call of Isaiah, and lo and behold, Isaiah had a lot to reveal to us about the God who calls us to serve. We thought about the God's calling of Isaiah and how God used Isaiah even before he specifically called him in Isaiah chapter 6. Very interesting thought. Who was he in Isaiah 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5? Well, he was Isaiah, the prophet. But in chapter 6, he receives a unique call from God, and his life is never the same. He is humbled like he had never been humbled. He thought he was a dead man. That always has a way of kind of changing your perspective. Those of you who have had near-death experiences, you remember that today for that very reason. They're dramatic. But Isaiah's was because he was in the presence of God. This is an important point. We can't miss this point. There's an overlap between relationship and service. Because God had a relationship with Isaiah, he was then able to conscript him into service for him. It also carries over into the third calling that we're going to be looking at today, in just a little bit. When God calls us into a relationship with himself, it's a life reorienting call, or at least it's supposed to be, okay? It's not supposed to be a head game. If you're looking at your life and you're saying, you know what, I thought I was a Christian, but there's just kind of no power, there's no vigor there, there's no life, there's no vitality, I don't see things changing in me or in those around me, and uh, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm still uh, the angry person that I was, I'm still the unforgiving person that I was, I'm still the bitter person that I was. Well, take a step back and examine that amazing grace of the gospel once more and ask the Lord, Lord, show me the joy of my salvation, reveal to me the power of what actually took place when I put my faith and trust in you. When God calls us into a relationship with himself, it's life reorienting. But for a heart that's truly surrendered to his lordship, some just can't settle for being a run-of-the-mill or a go-through-the-motions Christian. Yes, God used Isaiah before his radical God encounter. God will use us wherever we're at if we're willing to be used by him. But it was that God encounter that radicalized his following. And that's the difference. That God encounter that took place between God and Isaiah, it radicalized his following. Suddenly, Isaiah was a different person. A God follower, Isaiah 1 through 5, but a God radical in Isaiah chapter 6. So is, is, is that it? God calls us into a relationship with him, and the relationship yields fruit. It produces action. Uh, maybe that action is we're asked to serve in a church leadership team or 
Maybe we're challenged to give some time feeding the hungry or serving at Faith Family Kitchen, or uh, maybe we teach a Sunday school class or help greet people or, or drive people on errands that are in need, uh, maybe buy some people some groceries. Is, th- is that it? I mean, th- those things are great. And things like that are important. We all have to start somewhere with God. God of all beings knows how we are made in his image and that we are a people of process. How many Bible verses talk about starting as spiritual infants? Okay, God gets this. He's not expecting you to all of a sudden come to faith in Jesus Christ and all of a sudden you're out there like Elijah, right, uh, calling down fire from heaven. There's a process involved, okay? If the fire from heaven ever happens, right, that's up to him. But uh, how many verses speak about spiritual growth that we're supposed to endeavor for? How many challenges to grow and to mature in Christ, to shed the old understanding and take on the new one? to recognize that old wineskins aren't strong enough for the the new wine of God's message in our lives. It's right that God's call starts with relationship, but guess what? Some people never move on from there. It's as if spiritually they said, okay, I've heard the call to relationship, I'm done. I'm done. Some people never move on. Some people hear the call to respond to God's call to service, and then they shift into neutral and coast. What more could God want from me, possibly? What what more could he ask? I believe in him. I try hard to trust him. I'm plugged into a church. I've met all the requirements, right? Maybe for a time. Until God in his wisdom opens our ears to what I see in scripture as a third call. (coughs) Now, I'm just pulling these out. This is not three stages of, uh, of the Christian life or anything like that. I'm just trying to have us see that there's so many different ways and, and avenues through which God can get our attention. But it's this third one that, boy, I, I just think, I think it's the one that we really need to pray and ask God for ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts to receive. Earlier in Matthew 16, the passage that you just heard read, uh, Peter is coming off a great victory. Uh, I've said this a million times. Uh, Peter's my favorite. I love him because I get him. And uh, he reminds me so much of me in so many horrible ways. Uh, In a rare show of humility and restraint even, Peter leads the disciples in confessing that Jesus was not just some great teacher, not just some wise prophet, a sideshow miracle worker, none of those things. Peter confesses for the first time in Matthew 16 that Jesus is God in the flesh, the anointed Messiah to come and save God's people. Peter, to date, has never been so right on. Peter has never been so, like, in the groove of ministry, right? Jesus asked the question, Peter steps up, slow pitch across the plate, and Peter nails it, nails it. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. And so much so that Jesus responds to him, you know what, Uh, man didn't reveal this to you. God himself revealed this to you. And you're Peter, and on this rock, Peter means rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell won't stand against it. Can you imagine Peter, his chest just swelling and swelling and swelling as that whole uh, experience, that whole uh, 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 compliment is, is washing over him? Then perhaps... Riding high on his recent victory, Peter decides it's a good time to put Jesus in his place and explain to him how life is going to unfold. Jesus has just declared that the divine plan and purpose of God uh, to redeem his people is a path that would lead to a vicious and bloody cross and then to an empty tomb. And the text says that Peter felt the need to actually pull Jesus aside to set him straight. Picture that. Pull God in the flesh aside. Hey, come here a second. Come here. I, I, I got some words for you. What, what you just said is going to happen, that's not what's going to happen. Jesus, what you just said is the unfolding and the unworking, the, 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 uh, the uh, di- full display of your plan that's not how it's going to go down. We're going to come to your defense. 
uh, uh, there's going to be a, a groundswell of, of support and encouragement, and, 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 and people are going to rally to your side, and, 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 and we're, we're, we're going to squash this thing. You're going to be good. You don't have to worry about it. It's a laughable mental picture, isn't it? Until you suddenly realize how often I, you and I do the very same thing. How often you and I pull Jesus aside in our prayer times or in our thought life, and we say, Jesus, here's how it's going to go. Jesus, here's, here's the plans I have for me. I, I just simply need you to sign off, okay? Simple signature, initials even, and then we'll be good. God, you've called me into a relationship with you. You've opened some doors for me to do some ministry by you. Now let me clue you in on exactly how I'm going to need this to work out. You know, it should be a very sobering thought to every single one of us to realize that the Apostle Peter, Peter, Acts chapter 2, delivers a sermon. That sermon becomes the foundation stone of the building of the church in the book of Acts and for the rest of history, right? The Apostle Peter. It should be a sobering thought to realize that Peter went from being the rock that God would build his kingdom upon to God's adversary in the space of five verses. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Right after he said, you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. It should be a very sobering thought to every single one of us. In the space of five verses, Peter went from the rock to God's adversary. Why? Because the agenda became about him. He was going to call the shots. And this is where Jesus clarified the third call for Peter. After telling Peter that all of his plans and ideas were actually the plans and purposes of the devil himself, Jesus says this in verse 24 and 25, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. Peter, the plans that you're talking about, they're your plans. You better get on God's agenda. It's weightier than yours. Now, here it's important to note, and let's remember this as we think about these calls that we've been talking about. This is not Jesus' first word to Peter. Okay? His first word to Peter was, follow me. Go back to the very beginning of the Gospels. He sees Peter, he's there at his net. Peter, follow me, drops his net, goes and follows, okay? Jesus didn't start with pick up your cross. It was there, it was coming, but a little down the road. See, now Peter was ready to hear this. The first words of Jesus to Peter were follow me, and that call to follow led to months, maybe over a year even, of working that out serving alongside Jesus, but now Peter is ready to hear something deep in the heart of God's calling on his sons and daughters. I've called you into relationship. I've called you into service. Now I'm calling you to die. I'm calling you to die. After declaring God's purpose was to embrace the cross of Calvary, Jesus declares, you have a cross too. And you can thank me and praise me every single day of your life, as you should, that your cross isn't my cross. Because my cross was for humanity. You don't have to bear humanity's sin and suffering and shame. Your cross. You ever think about that? When Jesus says he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, what did the cross symbolize for Jesus? The cross symbolized for Jesus the full laying down of his will. He just prayed the night before, if there be any other way, take this cup from me. And then followed it with, not my will, your will.
What does the cross mean to you and to me? One of the things I've learned over these past 18 months of the COVID pandemic is just how easy it is even for Christians to fall into the mistaken belief that death is the enemy. What, what do we celebrate every Easter? Is death still the enemy? Does death have hold over you and me? Is death our number one fear in this life? Is death this big looming thing that I don't even want to talk about it, I don't even want to think about it? Don't, don't, don't mention that. I, I was talking to somebody the other day and, and uh, we were talking about the year that we were born Actually, I was talking to, to one person over here, and somebody came into the room as I was talking to them, and I said, I was born in 1970. And this other person said, oh, 1970? I remember 1970. Like, you remember 1970? Wow, okay, well, uh, that, uh, that's good. Well, when were you born? And, and, and she said, I'll never, I'll never say. I'll never say. It's like, really? You want me to guess? No. You don't guess? You don't talk about people's age? Here's the Christian perspective. Every year you have been alive is a testament to the faithfulness of God to you. Why would you want to hide it? Why would you want to hide it? Shirley, how old are you? 87 years of God's faithfulness. Right, exactly. I knew Shirley wouldn't mind. Uh, why? Why would, you, why would you hide that? Well, I'm getting this here, and this is hurting more, and this is what. Yes, God already told us this is breaking. This is wasting away. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. What is seen is temporary, but what's unseen is eternal. And that's where we fix our eyes. That's where we fix our hope. Death is not the enemy. It has been swallowed up in victory. When death is the enemy, we order our lives like Peter on the highest priority in life being the avoidance of death. Wherever death is the enemy, life in this world is the friend. James chapter 4, verse 4. Don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of this world becomes an enemy of God. On um, my recent uh, vacation, I was on a family reunion, and one of my nephews started asking uh, a group of us one evening as we were just all sitting around talking, name your top three movies, name your top three movies. And <clears throat> I was running around doing different things, so I didn't get to actually participate in it, but the, 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 the question stuck in my head, and, and, uh, uh, and, and this line from one particular movie as I knew this me message was, was coming up and just a couple of weeks later, uh, it, it, it resonated with me. Well, I think one of the best movies for me, to me, very subjective, um, I've always, always, always loved the movie Braveheart. I love the whole uh, history of England and Scotland and, and uh, just that whole uh, challenging time where William Wallace is, is uh, 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 conscripted, I guess, to, 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 to lead the Scottish people and try to unite the clans uh, to, to, uh, to come against the British and all of their oppression toward them. And he's got an, an unbelievable line, and uh, Talon, you're going to have to really juice the, uh, the audio on this, but I want you to hear, he's in prison, he's about to face uh, the reckoning day, uh, the battles are over, they're all behind him, and he's about to face a very harsh and brutal uh, uh, sentencing. Uh, for all of his leadership of the rebel forces, so they were considered by the British. And he's in jail, and uh, uh, this, this woman who is, uh, you have to have a woman that falls in love with you in order to be a movie in Hollywood, but uh, this woman who f fell in love with him, not historically accurate, but she's visiting in, in there, and she's trying to, to plead with him, you know what, uh, just plead Plead for mercy. Maybe, maybe the king will be merciful to you. Maybe, maybe there's something you can do that will uh, uh, stay this horrible death that you're about to face. And uh, this is the exchange that happens. My lady. Sarah. I come to
come to beg you to confess all and swear allegiance to the king that he might show me your mercy. Will you show mercy to my country? Mercy is to die quickly. Perhaps even live in a tower. In time, who knows what can happen? If you cannot believe. If I swear to him, then all that I am is dead already. Die, it will be awful. Every man dies. Not every man really lives. What a line. What a line. Th that, that's a line that, that, that followers of Jesus should own. Everyone dies. But do you know what real life is? Do you know what real life is all about? Do you know what peace you can experience in this life right now? Do you know what it means to be relieved of the debt of your sin? Do you know what it means to have new life? That's why it's called being born again. And I know the world doesn't like that term, and it's, oh, are you, are you one of those born-agains? And we kind of shy away from it. I know it does sound a little extreme, a little kind of cultish maybe or whatever. Hey, folks, Jesus said it. You must be born again. Get, to, get a brand new start. Get a brand new start at life. Jesus said, what good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world? yet forfeits his soul. Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus isn't talking here about living recklessly. He's talking about living a reoriented life. We need to go back up to Jesus' rebuke of Peter here and listen to the words once again that he said to him. He said this, Peter, you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. How often is that true? Of me. Bruce, you're looking at this situation through your eyes. Try looking at it through mine. Bruce, I hear your prayers, and you're telling me how this is wrong, and this is wrong, and this is wrong. Am I not sovereign? Have I abdicated? Have I become the God who sleeps and takes frequent naps? Or is Psalm 121 still holding true that I am the God who never slumbers and never sleeps? We've been uniquely designed in God's image, and as part of that image, we have been designed to cling to the one ultimate reality. It's either us, it's either this world, it's either our agenda, it's either our vision of life, or it's embracing God's call to relationship, growing in that relationship and getting those training wheels out and learning how to serve him. And, 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 and the, I, I tell you, the best way to do that is try something and see how it works. And if it's not for you, then, you know, God will let you know. But he's created you for a purpose within the body of Christ and there's something for you to do. But it's also in hearing his gentle voice calling us to lay down our lives. Not a popular message these days, but a biblical one. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul would summarize these very thoughts with these words. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, in other words, who, I, who am I today then? I'm still walking around. How can I be crucified if I'm still walking around? I'll tell you who I am. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Every step that I take is a step of faith in the God who loves me. God called to Samuel, and Samuel responds, here I am. 
God calls to Isaiah, and Isaiah responds, here I am. God calls his own son, and Jesus says, here I am. The cross that God had called me to is the laying down of my own life, and his call is for you and I to the same thing. What does it look like? I can't answer that for you. That's the great thing about the Holy Spirit. I don't even have to try. But he'll tell you. He'll tell you. There's a pastor and theologian uh, in Germany during World War II. His name was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And uh, he, was a, he was a pastor uh, in the Lutheran Church and uh, uh, as well as a, a scholar. He was a professor a uh, very learned man, and, uh, and he was conscripted, as most German men his age, to, uh, to serve in, uh, in, in Hitler's army, although when he was conscripted, he decided that the best use of his time would be to try to work against uh, the Third Reich instead of for it. But prior to that time, as he was a pastor and he was watching what was happening to his beloved country, Germany, and he was seeing that country begin to have a cozy, softening relationship between the state and the church. And he was beginning to see the church really start to succumb to the leadership and the, the, the whims of the state. No longer speaking prophetically to the state, but just kind of gently going alongside with it. And that troubled him deeply. As a matter of fact, he, uh, he reframed God's call on true Christians in the face of government. Governments of increasing oppression and labeling and suffering. And, and uh, he wrote a book called The Cost of Discipleship. Isn't that a great title? The Cost of Discipleship. Jesus talked about the costliness of following him. And it so troubled Dietrich Bonhoeffer to see what was going on. And, and, and he, he was so heartbroken at the way that he saw the, 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 the country moving. He was eventually uh, arrested, uh, for, uh, caught up in a, in a plot to actually assassinate Hit Hitler, of which there were many. I don't know if you knew that, but there were many plots to assassinate Hit Hitler. Uh, he was sentenced to uh, uh, Flossenburg, a concentration camp. And uh, you can go and visit it today, and you can find this plaque on the wall. It's in German, uh, but you can see Dietrich Bonhoeffer's name on it because that's where he was hung. And one of the memorable things, other than his writings, that Dietrich Bonhoeffer left behind is one of his most famous quotes. And he wrote it in that book called The Cost of Discipleship. And again, he was looking at the lukewarmness of the church the lukewarmness of the church when it came to the state and bowing every time the state said this and the state said that and saying, okay, the, the state is the supreme authority and we'll just go along with them. And it broke his heart and he, and he wrote this about the Christian life in this book, The Cost of Discipleship. He said, when God calls a man, he bids him come and die. Come and die. And it's when you forget that that the lukewarmness begins to seep in. And we become friendly with the world that Jesus called us to die to. We're going to have uh, a time of communion together as a church. And um, as we do this, we're going to have uh, uh, the elements here on, on this table. And the way that we do it, in times like this, we, I know we've been using the little crinkle cups. No crinkle cups anymore. Um, the bread and the cup that symbolize the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus. As we gather around these elements, and we're going to do it with a song. We're going we're to play a song for you. And, and during that song, you're free to, to just come and grab, uh, grab a cup, grab a, a a piece of uh, bread there. Because Jesus formulated this exercise, routine, habit 
for his followers. And he said, I want you to celebrate this meal that my people have been celebrating for thousands of years, the Passover meal. And I want you to remember the Passover that happened in Egypt, that they passed over the, the, the Hebrews so that that angel of death would take the firstborn of the, of the, of the uh, Egyptians. Well, no longer is this a Passover about slavery in Egypt. Now there's going to be a Passover that has to do with your sin. And this bread and this cup, they're to symbolize for you not that lamb that was sacrificed on that first Passover in Egypt, but the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And as we do it this evening, my encouragement to you is receive the bread, receive the cup, remember what Jesus has done for you, and dare to ask him, Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, Show me my cross. Now, I know everybody's not going to want to pray that. I, I, I get that. Uh, maybe everybody's not there, and maybe that's appropriate. But I just want to encourage you, if, if you feel God prompting you in your heart, as you have that bread, as you have that cup, and as you remember the sacrifice that he made for you, would you just utter that prayer? Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, would you show me my cross? He said in his word that those who would follow him need to take up their cross and follow. Jesus, by your Holy Spirit, show me my cross. As we sing this song in just a minute, uh, it's during that song you're free to, whenever you feel led, come up, grab a cup, grab um, bread, uh, and just use that time uh, as a reflection, remembering the body and the blood of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you in the name of Jesus, and we, we thank you for this time of communion. Lord, it is the union of your sons and daughters around this table, remembering the blood that has washed away our sin, and remembering that body that was broken on that cross. That was our cross. That was our sin. That was our penalty. That was our punishment. And you said, that's on me. I will pay your debt in full. We thank you for the cross of Calvary. Show us, Lord, what our cross might be. Pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
closing song today, we're going to do a song that we did for the first time back in Easter because, uh, as I mentioned in the, in the message, and this, I hope, rings true, in, in a message that talks about God calling us to lay down our lives, we're not just people who celebrate Easter, okay? We're not just people who happen to take a day a year and celebrate Resurrection Day. We're the resurrection people. We're the Easter people. The resurrection has begun in us and is going to be coming into full fruition when Christ returns. And uh, that is our inheritance and that is our joy. Why do we walk around with joy? Why do we persevere in hardship and trial? Because we're the Easter people. We're the resurrection people. And God is alive and at work in us. Even though we are dead in our trespasses and sins, we are alive in Christ Jesus. And that's what this song celebrates. was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now the Savior now to wash our feet now at his feet we bow the one who
His body there would not remain. Our God has robbed the grave. Our God has robbed the Resurrected King is resurrected. 